Hi, Billy Goodnick here, your host for Garden Wise, Santa Barbara's favorite place to learn about sustainable landscaping. You know, even after years of drought, there's still a lot of green lawns kicking around our neighborhoods. Some folks just love that swath of green. But other people are learning to love the lawnless life. And in this segment, we're going to look at alternatives on what to do with that space that's been covered with lawn for all these years. The grass isn't always greener on the other side, and neither is your lawn. Traditional lawns need a lot of water and require potentially harmful pesticides and fertilizers to grow and maintain. This is why many residents look to alternatives to their lawns. First, it is important to consider what is the intended use for the space. Are you in search of a recreation area for kids or pets? A seating area? Do you want the look of a green open space? Not all lawn alternatives are equal. Some may fit your budget and lifestyle better than others. Let's look at some options. First, walk-on ground covers, like Daimondia and Carapia. These walk-on ground covers don't require nearly as much water as a traditional lawn. In fact, Daimondia is drought tolerant, only needing to be watered occasionally. A typical traditional lawn needs to be watered two to three times a week. So a major positive is water conservation. Another pro is its low maintenance. It has a low growth habit, which means it doesn't grow tall. So no need for that lawn mower. Planted from plugs, it establishes itself rapidly. So you don't need to wait long for it to grow in. And because of its dense growth, weeds are minimal. But on the con side, it doesn't look like a traditional lawn. It has silver leaves and daisy-like flowers. Plus, it's not good for heavy activity, so if you have children that like to run and play, you may want to find something else. Carapia, aka Lipia, the other walk-on ground cover, is also drought tolerant and grows dense, so there are less weeds. Carapia is available in plugs or sod and is capable of outcompeting aggressive invasive lawns like Bermuda grass. That's one tough landscape. But like Daimondia, there are cons. The round leaves and little flowers give them a different look and feel than a traditional lawn. Carapia's flowers, in particular, are known to attract bees, which can be an issue for some people, but a plus for attracting pollinators to your garden. Carapia is low growing, but can be mowed to remove flowers for a uniform look. Option three is UC Verde Buffalo Grass. This grass is tough, designed for hard use that your kids could play on and enjoy. It is warm season grass that thrives in hot weather. Now I know that perked some years around here in Santa Barbara. Its drought tolerance is amazing, only requiring a fourth to a half an inch of irrigation a week once it's established. It also requires less maintenance and fertilizer than a traditional lawn, but it does require a little bit more attention than walk on ground covers. For example, because it is slow growth, you will need to mow and fertilize it. This is definitely a good choice for those in SoCal who get a lot of use out of their lawn, but it's not cheap. The grass seed and sod is on the pricey side, so you need to make sure it fits your budget before you plan to use it. Option four is Carex species, commonly known as sedge. These two can handle wear and tear like buffalo grass, but it takes longer to establish about four to eight months. So if you have pets that use the lawn, you might wanna go for another option. Carex is planted from plugs and grows in clumps. It can be mowed early to establish a more uniform lawn look, otherwise it will be a meadow appearance. It can grow in shade, sun, and thrives in all different types of soil, making it very versatile, which is a major plus. But versatility always comes at a price, and this one requires a bigger budget. Option five. Artificial turf. It is installed outdoors and the plastic carpeting has an infill material, either rubber or silica, between the blades that simulates dirt. The benefits of this one are that it requires no water, no mowing, and no fertilizers or pesticides. In terms of cons, because it's plastic, it can add to microplastic pollution. Also, because artificial turf has very low permeability, it kills all life in the soil below it. Once the artificial lawn has reached its useful life, approximately 10 years for sports fields and 15 to 30 years for residential installations, it can't be recycled and ends up in the landfill. Option six is to convert the lawn area into something else entirely. A colorful garden of shrubs and flowers, a seating area, a vegetable garden, a bocce ball court, a flagstone patio, and more. 
If you are converting this space to an outdoor entertaining space, you may be considering decomposed granite or gravel. Let's explore the difference between those two. Decomposed granite is a durable mineral surface that requires no maintenance and can be used for many purposes, like a driveway, pet space, or a patio. It's known to get muddy, so if it's next to your home, the mud may be tracked inside. So if you're a clean freak, decomposed granite may not be the option for you. Gravel or crushed rock surfaces also require minimal maintenance, stay clean, and allows water to drain right through it. Just keep it off slopes where it might be displaced by rain. Overall, each alternative to a traditional lawn has its upsides and downsides. So it is up to you to decide which works best for your lifestyle and your budget. For more garden inspiration, including virtual garden tours of inspiring gardens in Santa Barbara County, visit waterwisesb.org. Replacing your lawn can be a big decision, but maybe some of the examples we've shared with you will give you the inspiration to give it a try and join the club. Next up, I interview Allison Jordan, a professional landscape designer. She'll share a garden that she designed with us and also explain what it's like to work with a professional designer. Hi. For a while, we've been talking about landscape design and picking plants and that sort of thing, and hopefully a lot of people have learned more about it and are more comfortable doing their own design, but there's times when you just might want to hire a professional to give you a hand and figure out uh, your own landscape. So we're starting a new segment here, hope to do it uh, pretty much every episode, where we talk to designers about their process what they do, what you can expect when you hire a designer, and put you at ease about picking up the phone or sending an email and getting in touch with a professional designer. So I've got Allison Jordan here with me. Allison and I, well, Allison is the reason I'm on TV, started Garden Wise Guys a few years ago, uh, a few years ago, 15 years ago, and uh, now we've come full circle. So welcome aboard, Thanks. and I'm loving your creation. It's, uh, it's just a, in its infancy right now. It is, yeah, it was just put in October. October of this year, and we're in February, so yep. yeah, we haven't even turned a year, it's still in diapers. It is. Yes, okay. <laughs> so I wanted to start with how, how you get involved in something like this. Somebody's gonna pick up the phone, send you an email, whatever. How does, what would somebody anticipate if they finally got to the point where they said, I need, I need help? <laughs> Well, I would say typically someone either calls me or emails me and says um, they're interested in hiring me and we start the process there. So where does the discussion go? Do you have questions for them? They have questions for you? Uh... Yes, usually one of the most important things is, is to clarify that I'm a garden designer and so I'm not a landscape contractor, I'm not a landscape architect, so what that means. and so... Which is, what's the difference between say a landscape designer, landscape architect? The difference is, is that I'm not licensed, and so I um, typically do mostly plants and light hardscape, and if there's someone looking for somebody more for structural things and things that need to have you know, drainage and walls and things like that, then probably better with someone that is a licensed landscape architect who has a master's degree and has been certified by the state. So when the stakes go up, you'll refer them to somebody else? Right. So at least first, you get the first call, and then you can help them parse whether they're gonna stay with you or their needs are a little beyond. Right, and also clarifying, because sometimes people are just looking for someone to install the landscape. Right. And that's a landscape contractor. Yeah, they get, they get dirt under their nails. <laughs> yeah, no, we, I we get, get- We I, get graphite. Yeah, I get a pedicure. <laughs> or manicure. <laughs> manicure, yes. Yeah. Well, pedicure you, too. You could design with your feet. <laughs> okay, so you get the call and set up an appointment. Do you have them do any kind of preparation in advance or do you just show up start cold? Um, well, usually, you know, I just get the basic information. Address helps. Um, yeah, I guess yeah. so. And um, I like to kind of get uh, the initial conversation, everything in person. So usually it's just more the basics by phone or email, you know, clarifying what my role, like we said, and, mm -hmm. then, um, and then we set an appointment and I show up. Do people bring stuff to the table with you, photos or images or things like that? Is that all part of like a first visit so you kind of have some idea what they're, they're shopping for? It depends, but if people are, some people like to do that and that's great, I welcome that. Some people just want, have it in their head and they're going to, you know, just kind of share or as we walk around and look at the garden. Um, and sometimes people 
um, have less of an idea and they're really looking for me, right. you know, to give them what, what I think as I walk around. So what type of questions are you asking that they might need, uh, need to be prepared to answer? Well, I would break it down probably into two categories. One would be their needs of the landscape, what they're thinking they would need as far as function, like are they looking for an area for entertainment or do they want to just like here where we just updated an old lawn and did an, a front yard landscape? Um, are they looking for, you know, a children's play area, those kinds of things, just right. to get a sense of um, what they're looking for as far as how they want to use the landscape. So in a way, same as if you were an architect, designing a new house for them. How many bedrooms do you need? What kind right. of kitchen do you like? That sort of stuff, but transferring it to outside. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the other side of it is the aesthetics. So what style, what type of plants? Um, don't get too far into it in the initial meeting as far as like colors and all that kind of thing, but just getting a feel for what they're thinking and also the scale of the job, you know, as we walk around. So is it, do they just want to rip everything out and start oh. new? Are we bringing in like, you know, big trees and things like that? Or is it more just the smaller shrubs and perennials and that type of thing? A so tune up versus a, a wholesale remake. Right. right. So I'm looking up the street here and we have all different styles of houses. How does the style of the house affect what kind of garden you're going to design and does it matter to, to your clients? I think the style of the house um, drives the landscape design a lot and I think what I've found is most people are in tune with that mm -hmm. um, and we have so many um, different styles of homes here in Santa Barbara so it, it really does um, create a sense of style of the garden to be complementary to the style of the house. Um, yeah, so that's something that comes up in the, usually in the first. I, I think of it in terms of uh, if you were planning a meal, you know, you could put mugu gai pan with a standing rib roast, but you know, it doesn't always get you there. So yeah, there's a marriage between the landscape style and the house. It's all part of one story. Yeah, it is. It's the whole property. So should we have a look at what you did here? Talk a little bit about your design process. So we've, we've been through the interview. Um, the people love you. They're ready to hire you. They're going to just start sending money your way so you can do your work. Mm -hmm. How do you get started in terms of uh, delivering what they're looking for? Well, I will email them a proposal, and in the proposal I outline um, all of my tasks, and I have it line item by task. So that includes the initial site evaluation, the um, uh, plant list development, um, obviously the design, creating meetings, uh, meetings right. with clients, um, the uh, deliverables, which is the, the final plan with the plant list and specifications and everything so that they can then give that to somebody. So they can understand why you're charging them $150,000 for your design services. <laughs> well, we start working for Oprah, we'll, we'll right. go in that direction. Yeah. Okay, so you got here. What did you see before this lovely little baby garden went in? What was, what do you have to work with? There was an old lawn and there was a dying birch tree. And that's dying because the drought yeah okay yeah old-fashioned high water using garden mm -hmm. with birch trees and lawn for those of you who still have birch trees <laughs> give them up okay so and but it the 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 birch trees were they, were they pretty good size they were yeah especially so right here i'm big. guessing this is a west exposure this is all the afternoon heat those birch trees probably played a pretty important role just in terms of the house. They did because that's the living room right there. You can see that big window mm -hmm. um, and the sun just bakes in here, especially in the afternoon. So your job? Provide something screening. Okay, and we had, uh, so it was lawn, birch trees. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a big shrub over that way that's still there. That looks mm -hmm. like it's got some historic value. So decided to keep that? Yeah, the raphaelopsis. Um, when I look at a garden and especially when we're taking a lot out, I try to, see what we can keep just to keep some sense of scale and greenery um, so it doesn't you know just look like a you know bulldozer came in and took everything out because um, it takes a while for everything to regrow I mean this is five months old and you can see it's doing really well but having that over there it's it's nice to have that. Would you also be considering how appropriate that is to, to where you're going or how sustainable it would be to keep it? Yes for example if that was a birch tree 
it would have been gone. Just because it's so thirsty and... Yeah, and also the style of the landscape. Yeah. Um, it's a little tricky with established trees sometimes, but if it's stressed or really water using, um, then usually, you know, yeah, it's, it's going to uh, hit the chopping, that, chopping uh, block. It's always that, should I stay or should I go? What are you going to get rid of? Um, I see a, a adorable, if I can use that term, little creek bed running through here. And aside from looking nice, I'm guessing you got something to say about it. So why don't I we do. go over, okay. uh, bring our kayaks and our canoes and here we go. do some whitewater rafting. <laughs> so we're here at the headwaters of the uh, Colorado River, heading down toward the Grand Canyon. And uh, Allison, tell us about this. What's it, uh, what's it here for, other than just looking nice? Well, this adorable little dry creek bed uh, actually provides a really good, important function, and that's something that I like to look at when I'm doing my initial site assessment, is how we can take the rainwater from the roof and bring it into the garden and retain it on site. Mm. So we slow it, we spread it, and we sink it into the garden, and then we don't have to have the runoff go out into the street and down into the ocean. It, so you're not only protecting the creeks by keeping excess water mm -hmm. off of there, but you're also allowing it to percolate down into the garden. Yes. And um, one of the inspirations on this site was when I came here, most of these boulders were here. Ah. And they were just sort of um, placed haphazardly. And I thought, um, well, that's going to make it super easy to do a creek bed. And it also creates a a nice feature in the garden, you know, front yard. Um, one of the things when there's not a lawn is to create um, kind of this spatial um, and visual balance, mm -hmm. I think. And, you know, you, it, a lot of times you'll see if there's too many, like one of this, one of that, one of this, um, it gets a little um, busy. So it's nice to have using rocks and stones and other things to kind of have some sort of um, non-plant feature. Yeah, and it, it's a pretty line. It has just mm -hmm. a nice soft kind of soft curve to it. Yeah. Great, so this is doing something and it also brings the eye a little treat. Fabulous. This is an Arbutus marina, strawberry tree. Okay, what, what's it gonna, who's it gonna be when it grows up? And you're calling it a tree, but not your typical lollipop trunk. So what, what are your favorite things about this? The bark. Love the bark and the red flowers. and the flowers. Yeah. And then when the fruit comes out and I was picking up off the brick. So the one of the things that I went with aesthetically was the the red oh. kind of tone. There's a few things, plants here, and this is one of them that picks up on that. Nice touch. OK, now don't take this personally, but a lot of your gardens suffer from a condition known as one of each itis. And that comes from going to the nursery on impulse and buying some ooh shiny pretty plant putting it in the garden and, and just sort of thinking, where do I put this? One of the advantages of, of hiring a professional gardener is they have some sense of restraint. And that's one of, I think one of the best reasons of having somebody who knows their plants and uh, has some sense of how to organize them. So let's talk a little bit about plant palette, what you start with, how many plants do you begin with, and how do you make those decisions about what actually ends up going in the garden? Good question. So how I start, um, there's a lot of plants out there and so you got to narrow it down. So what are the things that narrow it down? One is I ask the client, send me pictures, go online, give me ideas. Um, the WaterWise web, plant website is a great place to start. Other um, sites or just going around town and take a little picture, you know, with your phone. So but not while you're driving with one hand out the window. Right. Just a little caution. Right. Yes. Um, so that, so I receive that information and then as we were talking about style, I know that I, we talk about we wanted to do a Mediterranean garden with kind of a California native flair. I knew the client was interested in incorporating California natives. Um, so all of that information goes into and then knowing um, what plants I know are going to work, looking at the color um, palette that we want to go with, all of that. And I develop a potential plant list and then I send that to the client with images and that they can look at and rank, um, love it, just okay or no thanks, and then they send that information back to me. So when you're putting that initial palette together, what are, uh, it's fine if it looks pretty, but it's mm -hmm. gotta grow here. So what are some of the criteria you use to say, yeah, this plant could work, if they like this plant, it'll work here because? Well, the microclimate is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can see we're, getting a little hot here this <laughs> afternoon. Um, we're pretty much west, southwest facing here. 
So it gets really hot in the afternoon, so that's certainly one factor. Um, the water usage here, we wanted to go very low water using. These are really low water using plants. Um, after they're established. Yes, after they're established, on the very low range um, of water use. And then also um, the colors and the um, aesthetic appeal, and also as we talked about the function, the screening and mm -hmm. those types of things. So of the plants here that are really performing some function, we're really just talking about the, the arbutus over there that's gonna give us some shade. Anything else here that, uh, that, that you can't do without? Any specific plants that need to be here? I would say the westringa in front of the house and the New Zealand flax. One of the things to think about when you're picking out plants is, is it gonna look good year round? Mm. Or what's the season of the plant as well? So I try to use things that are, I call them 365 plants, you know, that look good all year to be um, kind of our anchors. And also we did a little kind of mini hedge right here with the sunflower, um, things like that. Great. Um... So the rest of it comes down to aesthetics, having a color scheme here. Mm -hmm. um, can we just look at a few of your, your favorite plants in here and maybe share with people what you like about those plants and what to expect? Because what's really important right now is that these are all in their infancy. And you, if this garden looks a little bit sparse, that's okay because all these plants are going to grow up. So I'm going to sing your praises here because I really like what I'm seeing going on with, with the color scheme. and. You know, um, having done this, I've got, I can kind of picture where it's going. You've got the yarrow. This is called uh, moonshine with beautiful golden flowers, silvery foliage. And then you're repeating the silver in the Diamondia ground cover, which is also going to have little yellow flowers on it. And then back there, the Westringia. Which variety? Gray that? box. That's gray box. So that's not going to get much bigger than the height of the windows. Mm hmm so uh, tell me about that sort of continuity and, and repetition of, of uh, colors in here. Well, as you were saying, having um, restraint as well as um, a design and the, how the plants flow together. Mm -hmm. So you really want to have um, continuity, but then change. So that was the, sort of the idea of keeping in the gray theme, but then having like the pop of yellow and transitioning to the Westringa where it's a um, more of just, you know, an established shrub and... So, so the gray is the unifying sort of harmonious aspect of, of four very different plants and then you get the variety out of them from, from their individual differences. Right, yeah, so you can see how it ends up really feeling um, like it's all meant to be, hopefully. Right. <laughs> that it visually it, it connects to each other. So why um, the the um, verbena and the lavender. Any reason why you would have two different plants with purple flowers? Well, as you mentioned, they're similar in function and um, shape, but they have different um, flowers, obviously, and the foliage is different, but there's similarities again, too. So it's like that where there's similarities, but contrast. Gotcha. So I could have just had all lavender there, mm -hmm. but I think... Um, switching it up creates a little more visual interest and as we were talking about you know the the scent of the verbena and um, just the different leaf structure and all that. And the one other plant I want to point out here and I and um, I don't know that not that I'm the be all in the end all that I would have thought to use that dark brown New Zealand flax there but given the colors of the house the brick the door etc it's a it's a really nice touch was that something you immediately knew you would use or more of just kind of an inspiration? I think um, actually it was immediate because there, I have to say it wasn't all me. There was one here before oh. and it was a little tired and um, old. And so we, I thought it looked really nice when I came here, but I knew it just needed a fresh new look. And I actually went with a little bit darker just because of the black and the brown with the shutters and the door. but. Yeah, that was the inspiration. So when I get old and tired, I can just be replaced and refreshed with uh, another version of me. But yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, we'll a little newer, there. a little darker. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to wrap this up. Allison, you've been fabulous. It's Thanks. lovely to see what you're doing with design. And I hope this has helped uh, all the viewers figure out why 
to use a landscape designer, a professional designer, where you might want to call them in and uh, wish you well with your garden. Thank you, Allison, for helping us understand what a professional garden designer does and for explaining what it takes to create a beautiful, low water using garden. Next up, Kathy Perret will give us the lowdown on micro spray irrigation, the pros and the cons. Take it away, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Perret with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation. In our segment today, we're going to talk about micro spray irrigation and drip irrigation. What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of both of these really efficient types of watering? Micro sprays, which is what I'm holding in my hand and what I'm looking at down here, allows you to water waves of plants, more of a ground cover where you don't have one individual plant and another individual plant elsewhere. It also waters in gallons per hour of application. What you'll notice is that you can apply different amounts of water depending on the color of the nozzle the microspray you put on. The black nozzle puts the least amount of water in, hour, in gallons per hour. This is less than four gallons over a full hour over the little space that it waters, about two feet in circumference. The next color up is the blue color, and the blue nozzle, that's what I have here in this garden, puts off closer to eight gallons per hour. The green nozzle puts off almost 15 gallons per hour, and the red will put off more than 20 gallons per hour. Let me show you real quick on this example. You can buy the, no you can buy the risers, you can buy the attachment, and you're going to actually, this one uses a screw, so it screws the riser into it, and then you select which direction you want to throw. I'm going to use the blues. I find those are the most efficient for me, and they don't clog up as easily as the black. It's easier if you use a little tool. This one has a hex wrench in the back. You can use just a basic little just a little wrench or something. They're kind of hard on your fingertips. And then what you do is it has a screw and you just screw it in. You want to make sure that when you do attach it to the spaghetti tubing, which is this black tubing right here, this one is already attached. It has a barb and you're going to stick the spaghetti tubing right onto that. You're going to put this into the garden space and there's a little teeny arrow and that tells you what direction the water's throwing. So the goal for me is to try and keep it within my garden space. That's one of the disadvantages of micro sprays is that it doesn't really have a defined pattern as well as a drip system which drops it right at the roots of the plant. So this particular little guy here and the geranium has an individual drip emitter right down here about four inches from where the root is. And if you want to see it, you can see that the water is, is in little driplets, little droplets. It's not streaming. Drip systems and micro spray systems, they take maintenance. When you turn it on in the spring, you have to turn it on. Walk around with extra emitters extra tools so that you can adjust those micro sprays, make sure they're not spraying on the sidewalk, bring some repair connectors. It never fails somewhere in the winter when you're not using them. Someone hits it with a shovel. You're pruning the old dead flowers and you cut the little line and you have to repair them, but super quick, super easy, very inexpensive, and then every person can do it. You don't have to hire a professional. Just make sure you look at your sprinklers when they're running. Now that you have a little bit of a better understanding of the advantages and the disadvantages of micro spray and drip irrigation, you'll be able to actually walk your own system, do your own repairs, and maintain it so that it's as efficient as it possibly can be. The next challenge is determining how long do you need to water every time you turn it on. Visit waterwisesb.org and utilize the watering calculator to help you get a better grasp on how long to water those sprinklers. Thank you, Kathy, for explaining the ins and outs of micro spray irrigation. Now you're an expert and you can impress all your friends. Now I'm going to take you to Seaside Gardens in Carpinteria to look at some succulents. Some folks love them, some folks hate them. 
Maybe by the time I'm done showing you my favorites, you'll invite a few into your garden. I'm at Seaside Gardens today and we're here to talk about succulents. It's kind of a love-hate thing. When I interview a lot of clients uh, and ask them, well, what kind of plants do you like? The answer is often, oh, I don't really care anything except succulents. And I don't know why they get such a bad rap, and I sort of do. There's a few problems with succulents. Um, if you're trying to create kind of a, a normal, traditional type of garden, these look like you're out in the Sonoran Desert where I'm standing right now. The good news is that there are also some succulents that fit into, into just about any style of garden. They're low water using, they're almost zero maintenance, and uh, I think I can convince you that there's some that belong in your garden. Meet one of my best friends. This is one of my go-to plants as a low ground cover. Uh, botanical name, Senecio mandrillicia, and uh, common name is blue chalk fingers, and you can see from the color, it's got a bluish tinge to it, and it looks like fingers that are made out of chalk. Gray and blue-gray are fabulous colors in just about any garden because they offset whatever's near them. Um, even though I'm not uh, endorsing for this segment these uh, um, aloes over here, you can see how a little bit of silvery gray around greens really gives the green a pop and it makes uh, this kind of a nice canvas or bedding. Um, this is a plant you can buy very inexpensively because it often comes in flats with 50 or 60 plants in them and they only have to be spaced about 18, 24 inches apart. Sometimes I go about 30, 32 inches apart and they'll stay low and they'll fill in. They do get a flower, but it's inconsequential. In fact, some people just break them off, um, but it's a real go-to plant. It takes very little water, uh, no trimming, and I've never seen any kind of pest go after it. So keep this on your palate, and we'll talk a little bit later about how it combines with other plants. Senecio mandrillicia. So staying with the ground covers, this is one of many forms of ice plant. Ice plant can come in a range of colors from deep purples to bright reds to uh, lavender, pink colors. This one, Malifora crocea, is, as you can see, this bright yellow color. And that's amplified even more by having the light colored foliage here. This is another ice plant, uh, more of a gray green, but talking about this one, what I love about this ice plant is that it's a winter flower. Uh, which means in the rest of your garden when things are turned off and not really putting on much of a show You get these bright cheery colors on a cold winter day. It's just wonderful It just happens to be growing next to our uh, blue chalk fingers And this is another great example of how uh, The gray blue of this foliage color and the green work well together and create a really bright contrast Even if this weren't flowering the other thing I want to point out here and this is just a design tip when you have two plants that have the same sort of structure and these have the same type of leaf in this finger-like form, it's a nice way to harmonize the garden and have plants that have some similarities but also a lot of differences. If you happen to have any rotten tomatoes sitting around while you're watching this, please move them away because I know what you're going to be thinking. I'm going to talk about jade plant. If you're rolling your eyes. Jade plant, you got to be kidding, but this is such a workhorse. Uh, divorce yourself from the fact that it's maybe the most common plant in any garden. There's a reason for that. A, its shape is just perfect. It's like this big fluffy cloud and it stays this way and stays very symmetrical. In the winter time, in cool weather, and it sometimes persists into the summer, we get these beautiful little red margins. And even though from a distance you don't really see them, it contributes to the color of the foliage in here. I think it's a really nice touch. The other thing we have are these beautiful five-pointed flowers. These are beginning to fade, end of season, but you can see this wonderful little star shape in here with a soft pink. So imagine that throughout the winter time, and uh, this deserves to be in your garden. So consider it. Uh, all you need is a friend who's growing some, and you can break off anything up to a trunk this big. Let it heal in the shade for a couple of weeks, just so that the, uh, the soft tissue dries up a little bit and just bury it in the ground a little bit and it'll just start growing uh, and do a great job. It takes full sun, it'll grow in partial shade, um, and it'll give you years and years of joy. Meet the Aeonium, another one of my go-to plants. Sun, shade, very little water, uh, average garden water if you need it. My favorite thing about this plant is it just looks so cheery. It's like each head is the, uh, the face of a daisy flower. 
I'm going to show you a lot of different colors and sizes. These range from low ground covers to taller plants. Uh, a lot of them get spectacular flowers on them, and it just does a great job in the garden. I like using it where I have a tree where you don't need to water underneath it. This plant will tolerate that kind of shade and uh, just gradually colonizes and spreads. I would guess this area that I'm in, which is about 20 feet long, probably started out as a dozen plants, and they've gradually pupped or sent out new growth from the bottom to fill in the area. So if you're patient, buy a few plants, put them in, and uh, propagate from there. Follow me over here. Okay, another little baby cousin of Aeonium. This is marked Aeonium Voodoo, and you can see similar structure but more separation around the leaves, but what's really great about it and a lot of other um, Aeoniums is this dark burgundy, almost black color. In this one, it's a special treat because the inside leaves stay are green when they emerge. They gradually turn more purple. So if you want a pop of contrasting color in your garden, you could mix these two together, a big swath of one and a swath of the other, or just the, use them as a filler in the garden where you want to change up the color, not necessarily have to do it with flowers. Aeonium Voodoo. Okay, another great feature of Aeonium and a lot of these other succulents is how easy it is to propagate them just by breaking off a piece and replanting it. Um, I don't know that that's how this came about. This may have all been uh, individual plants, but this is what you have as an opportunity to fill in your garden once you have a few plants that are up and running and will take a little bit of cutting. Um, there are so many different forms of Aeonium. I'm not an a, a, a expert on them, so I don't know every single name, but there's tall purple, and then we've got the taller green forms, and you can see what a great contrast this creates. Not only that, but especially this purple one is so dramatic when it decides to flower. So we've got these brilliant yellow flowers with the purple background, and they just create a stunning backdrop. Uh, these are standing probably about four and a half, five feet tall. They're about chest high for me, um, so you can use them as shrubs. One other thing to look at, occasionally this happens on an Aeodium uh, and a lot of other succulents. This is called crested, and it looks like a defect, but it's actually something a lot of collectors uh, seek. Another really fun thing to do with succulents are just these little potted arrangements. You can have them on the porch, on a patio table. They can even come indoors for a few months. Just give them bright light. Don't overwater them. But you can have a lot of playful fun. Uh, there's often workshops here on how to create these types of arrangements. But it just shows you the diversity of shapes and forms and colors that we get when we explore all the different succulents. Hundreds of different types to choose from. We were talking about jade plant previously. This is a relative of jade plant. They're all under the genus Crassula, um, but this one is called Undulatifolia. I've also seen it called um, Blue Wave, and there's a few varieties of this. Um, just a, a beautiful, delicate little plant, but it's this crinkly texture, again, to the foliage that makes it a real standout. Notice also the sort of gray-blue um, green that works together. Speaking of gray, green, blue, in terms of foliage, this isn't putting on much of a show, but it does look really nice intermixed with the blue chalk fingers, and it's called rock porcelain, also known as calendrinia. Great color, great form. This is a plant called Echeveria, um, and they come in a range of sizes from the cutest little ones called hen and chicks, uh, to these more robust ones, to some even more grand ones. What they all have in common is this sort of rosette form, which I find really interesting uh, in the garden. A lot of succulents have these. And in this case, kind of a fleshy, chalky, blue-green color. Uh, the flowers are just starting to emerge in this beautiful orange color. And it's just a really nice size to do in clusters or in groupings. Here's its bigger cousin. This one is called Echeveria andromeda. There's another one very similar to it, probably more common, called uh, Ruby Glow. Uh, and you can see on this, we've got this fabulous little sort of pink edge, pink fleshy edge, and more of kind of a crinkle cut. No, those are french fries. Anyway, we've got this uh, crinkly edge to these, which gives it a, even more of a personality. Just my luck, it's been raining for days, and these uh, containers are very heavy with water, so I don't have to go to the gym today. Uh, this is a plant called Cotyledon baharensis, also known as felt elephant leaf. 
and I just love it as a piece of sculpture in the garden. Usually plant just one of them or put it in a big pot, but you can just see its personality here with these kind of rusty colored uh, top of the leaf. It's got this fabulous, almost unique uh, shape to the leaf and then this more kind of open type of structure. Beautiful plant near an entryway. Give it room, it'll get uh, the size of a person or larger. Uh, so give it some room to spread out. Doesn't really take pruning uh, or put it in a pot. It's also got some cousins that are a little bit smaller and better behaved. And stay right there, I've got another real show off for you. Also weighing in at a couple thousand pounds. Um, it's more common relative is just called elephant food. Fortunately, there's no elephants here in Carpinteria today, but this is a, gro a ground cover variety. This is Portulacaria um, afra, and then the other name that's added onto it is variegata, and it's a low growing ground cover. The nice thing about these variegated shades is if you put them in partial shade, they really animate the space. Uh, they have bright foliage colors, so they reflect a lot of light zero water, put them underneath trees where you're not going to be irrigating in the summertime, like oak trees and stuff out near the periphery, and they'll put on a real show. The other thing, if you look closely, they've got burgundy colored stems. So if there's anything else with that color nearby, it's going to amplify that or just create a really beautiful contrast. So that's a look at succulents here at Seaside Gardens. They're in all of our local independent nurseries, so check them out. I hope you've kept an open mind and you'll consider bringing some succulents back into your garden. Just know, low water, low maintenance, and not all of them are trying to rip you open. Thank you, Billy, for that interview. It's great to have guests who are well-informed and know what they're talking about. So thanks for staying with us. It shows that you're part of a positive change in our community and that you're helping out by creating beautiful, responsible, water-wise landscapes. That does it for this show. I'm your host, Billy Goodnick. Stay water-wise, Santa Barbara County.